Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I have some bad news. We're out of wine. Imagine hearing those words as a host of a party, and the party has still got some time left to go. Now, all of a sudden, maybe it's a little bit more of a problem. We're out of wine. You can almost hear somebody go, no. This is the dire situation we find our Savior involved in this morning in our gospel text. He's at a party and the wine has run out. This is quite the social blunder at such a feast, a wedding feast. And having just been to a wedding myself, my own wedding, I kind of read this text with a fresh perspective, and I felt a little bit more keenly the sting of the embarrassment that it would be to run out of wine in the middle of a party. And it would be bad enough at one of our weddings where reception is usually four to five hours. If two hours in, you run out of drinks. But... For the Jewish wedding feast in this day and age, it lasted seven days. So can you imagine, this doesn't tell us when exactly, but we know it's ahead of time. And well enough ahead of time that Jesus makes wine out of, like many gallons of wine out of water. So maybe two or three days in, and they're they're about halfway through this seven-day event, and there's no wine. And wine is a symbol of prosperity, provision, and joy which should be in abundance at a wedding feast. Well, a lot is made of this first miracle of Jesus. But if you stop and think about it for a moment, at first glance, this is sort of an odd miracle. It's an odd thing for the Son of God, newly declared by John the Baptist. His first miracle is, Solving the problem of too little wine at a wedding feast. Does that seem weird to you? It doesn't seem like to me that would be very high up on the list of tasks. You would want the chosen one you've been waiting a millennia for to arrive to really begin doing. So it makes it even more strange that this is in fact exactly what the Messiah, the Son of God, does. But if we dig a little bit and take a closer look at the text, we'll see that this miracle actually reveals some big information about who Jesus is and what he's here to do. And the best way we can illustrate that is by looking at the context of our gospel reading this morning. It's the beginning of the second chapter of the book of John. And in the first chapter, you're probably all familiar with the beginning of the book of John, with the very fun to read In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, that whole part, which leads into John the Baptist baptizing, which leads into John the Baptist baptizing Jesus. So he says, there's somebody coming after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. And then Jesus shows up, and behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then right from there, a couple of John's disciples become Jesus' disciples. Andrew and his brother Simon Peter, and then Philip and his brother Nathaniel. And each time, one of the brothers, it's revealed to him that this is Jesus, the Son of God, and he goes to his brother and says, I found the one that we've been waiting for, the Messiah. So this isn't just some prophet, some some wise teacher, but the one that is to come. And at the very end of that section in chapter 1, this is the last verse of chapter 1, before we get to our gospel reading today. So Nathaniel was like, not really sure, because he says he's from Nazareth, and he's like, what good can come from Nazareth? And then Jesus then demonstrates that he's known about him before he met him, and then he's like, whoa, you're God, you're the Son of God. And Jesus says, if you're impressed with that, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened. And the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Wow. Imagine you're one of the new disciples of Jesus. You've been convinced he's the Messiah and he lays that one on you. 
you're raring to go. You're like, all right, what are we doing? And then the very next verse, pan to a normal wedding feast. I can almost see the disciples looking around and going, huh? This is not where I expected to be. Maybe they're searching around for the angels that are going to show up at some point. But no, they're just in this normal celebration in their society. A marriage feast, just like any other marriage feast that Jesus was invited to attend along with his disciples. So it begs the question, why is Jesus taking the time right after he's been declared the Messiah, has got his first few disciples, to go to a party. And remember, this isn't just like a three-hour stint. This is a whole week. Doesn't seem to make sense. It seems like he's lost his focus on what he came here to do. Because he's partying it up at this wedding feast. Well, Jesus does this for a few reasons. One is that he values marriage. Jesus' mere presence at this wedding feast demonstrates his approval and honoring of the institution of marriage as God ordained it. So it's not an insignificant thing in the eyes of God, which is really crazy to think about. The seemingly normal routines and rituals that God has put in place for his people None are insignificant, such that the very Son of God, the Messiah who's saving the whole world, gladly attends such an event. And this demonstrates to us that the nature of Christ's ministry from the very beginning is one that responds to the needs of human beings. Now, sometimes we maybe don't recognize the proper needs which he's going to respond to, but that's what he is about. Both the grand, ultimate, and big need of our salvation in the eyes of God and these small, seemingly insignificant needs that need to be met as well. And in doing so, all of those little, minute moments of miracles addressing immediate human needs point more and more to the grand mission and purpose for which he is here. And that's apt at this point in the church here, because we just celebrated the birth, the enfleshment, the incarnation of God in Jesus, and then his revelation and baptism. And now he's off to do what God sent him here to do, meet our needs. And then also, when we look at the text a little bit here in John chapter 2, we see that this miracle is really about cleansing us and purifying us. And there's some particular imagery that is used here to denote that that is, in fact, precisely the nature of the task that God has set Jesus here to do. So, the first miracle, water into wine. So how does this play out in the text? Well, the wine has run out. Mary is related to or is good friends with the host, and so she's set out to try and fix the problem to save them the embarrassment. And she knows that her son is somebody special. And so she turns to Jesus and says, they've run out of wine. It's a strange thing to just turn and say. And Jesus' response is kind of funny. Sort of tongue-in-cheek, he says, woman, what does this have to do with me? He himself is asking the very question that we, when we really think about it, are asking ourselves, why is the Son of God the one being asked to replenish the wine at a wedding feast? Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. Now Jesus is alluding to the purpose of his ministry. Anytime Jesus refers to his hour as not yet come, He's referring to the hour of his death on the cross. The purpose for his whole ministry here. What does this have to do with me? And sometimes we see in other places with the miracles that Jesus is concerned with people not realizing that this small 
manifestation of his glory is meant to point them to the full manifestation of his glory on the cross. He's not here to be the bread and fish king and replenish the wine at your parties. He's doing that to point you to the greater thing that is to be done. Yet Mary knows, and she continues to be this great example of faith, that whatever he decides will be the best possible decision, and so she places the matter entirely in his hands and just tells the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. So Jesus could have, as we might expect, if we're somebody as important as the Messiah, to say, deal with it yourself. But he doesn't do that. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, the one they've waited millennia for, deals with this small little problem. This miracle indicates both at the same time Jesus' authority and power over creation and the depth of his grace and love even for the little insignificant things of this life. Or rather, he's reorienting us to know that these things aren't insignificant because if God is paying attention to them, so should we. This miracle is also surrounded and inundated with cleansing and purification imagery. It's indicating to us that this is what Jesus has come to do. He has come to cleanse and purify, and not in the Old Testament way. See, verse 6, it takes out a little time in the text to specifically mention these stone jars which were used for rites of purification. In Mark chapter 7, there's a little bit more of a lengthy description of what that means. And essentially, the rites of purification are the washing of their hands and the vessels that were used to eat so that everything was clean. And in Mark chapter 7, when it goes through this big, long explanation, about a couple verses long, it uses the same verb in Greek that we use for baptism. Baptizo. To cleanse or to wash And Jesus is here to do exactly that. So it's no coincidence he uses these jars to show that he's come to be a part of this cleansing and purifying, not the temporary cleansing and a washing of the hands before a meal, but something deeper. And not yet known to his disciples or Mary or any of the guests, but soon... The wine will be seen as an image of more than prosperity, abundance, and joy, but also the cleansing blood of the Messiah, the Lamb of God, as John the Baptist declared, who has come to take away the sin of the world. Not a simple washing of water, as we know and attest to when we witness baptisms here in our church, but a water with the word cleansed with the washing of the blood of the Lamb. But the pointing forward to the foretaste of what is to come doesn't end there. Because what happens after the the water becomes wine, the, the MC of the marriage feast stops everything and makes an announcement. And letting people know that the joy is now full. It has been restored. This event has been fully restored which is also what Jesus has come to do, to bring fulfillment of our joy. When we get depictions of heaven in the scriptures, it's not a glum place where we just go about our days for eternity. It's described in the same language that a marriage feast is described. In fact, it's often called the marriage feast of the Lamb and His kingdom, which has no end. This is what Jesus has come to restore and fulfill, to make our joy full. And so he does here at this little wedding feast in Cana all those years ago. So he's doing today in our midst, all the time and throughout the world, restoring the full joy of in our relationship with God and pointing to that sure and certain future of the marriage feast of the Lamb. 
But before we get to the final marriage feast of the Lamb, triumphant victory image, we're still here in the meantime, aren't we? So what's going on now? Like back at this marriage feast, Jesus has turned water into wine. He's restored the joy of this celebration. But what about us, stuck somewhere in the middle? Well, Jesus embodies this miracle in himself for us still today in our very midst. Right here. We are gathered today in celebration. Did you know that this is the primary image associated with the Lord's Supper? That is a celebratory meal, a high point in our service, because it is the foretaste of this feast to come. Just like that miracle of turning water into wine was a foretaste of Christ's earthly ministry of what was to come, so too our celebration of the Lord's Supper here gathered around the altar of Christ is a foretaste of our full joy that is to come in the marriage feast of the Lamb. And let me tell you, the host of this feast will not let the wine run out. For this is no mere wine, no good wine among earthly wines. You know, maybe you're thinking of like, wow, maybe we could have like a $10,000 bottle of wine. That would be a good wine. Well, this is even better. And you might be saying, oh, pastor, we know it's Concord grape. It's not that great. But that's not the point. Because what Christ has done is he has come and he has turned that wine into the blood of his son. The holy and sacrificial blood that washes you clean. That purifies you deeper than any washing of water out of the stone jars of purification ever could. And it flows abundantly from our Savior's riven side for you poured out as a cleansing river to restore our right relationship with God. And as great as that is, and as wonderful as the promise that you receive when you come and take those elements into your body is, this is described in the scriptures as merely a foretaste of what God is going to do when Christ returns, when the joy that he has brought is full. So dear friends in Christ, from now on when you read the story of the wedding at Cana, and maybe you kind of wrinkle your brow at the peculiar, peculiarity of this miracle, let it remind you and point you to the full joy that is now yours in Christ. Let the wine remind you of the blood of Christ that has purified you deeper than any washing of these stone jars can. It has washed away your sin and all of your guilt before God, and now you stand before him redeemed, a beloved child. Let it remind you of this celebration we gather around at the altar here at church, where that promise is continually brought to bear in your life to remind you that it's there, to uplift you and strengthen you in your faith in that promise and in that foretaste to point you to what is to come the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which will have no end. Let this story remind you of what that means for those who have left this earthly life. That this miracle at Cana indicates what Christ came to do, which was to conquer death. And in restoring that relationship with God, you know who's going to be at the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom which has no end? All of those who have died in the faith and gone before, celebrating in full joy at the throne of God. And we too will be there one day. So dear friends in Christ, it's fitting that the first miracle of Jesus' public ministry here on earth takes place at a wedding feast that it involves changing water into wine and the purification jars. Because that's what he came here to do. He came here to display his glory, to meet our needs, both small and our ultimate need of redemption in God, to restore our joy to full, and to bring us into his kingdom forever, where the marriage feast of the Lamb goes on without end, 
and celebration where the wine doesn't run out and the joy never wavers. This feast and celebration is of the eternal union and marriage of Christ and us, the church. And this celebration won't be like my wedding or yours, four or five hours at a wedding reception. Nor will it even be like the seven-day celebration of this marriage feast in Jesus' day. But it'll go on forever, with the host being God himself, doling out all his grace and joy for you. All because of Jesus, the one whom we have waited for and what he has done. In the name of Jesus, amen.